children's song. It's actually um, a song for little kids to, so that Bigfoot doesn't take them. <laughs> Hello everyone. Yat e. So yat e in Navajo, it means hello, but it also means good. So yat eh, I hope everything is all good with you and in your life. Um, yat eh is such a beautiful word. I love to say it all the time. Um, so in, in the Navajo way, we would introduce ourselves with our clans. So if I was um, speaking to other Navajo people, I would say, hashkan uh, I am Yucca Fruit Strong Out and Align Clan, which is my mother's clan and her mother and her mother all the way to the beginning of time. Then I would go on with my father's clan, which is bitter water. I am born for bitter water. And then I would go to my third clan, which is my, my mother's dad. It would be Tachitni Dashiche. Tachitni means the, the red streaks on the side of the cliff. Um, it's formed by um, rain. And then I would go to my, my fourth and final clan, which is my, um, my father's father. Um, and that is Ashihin no Da'adashanala. And Ashihin means salt, the salt clan. Um, so all of my clans have like this relationship to water. Um, the first one being um, yucca fruit strung out in a line. It's a specific type of yucca that grows in a specific area, um, usually in the higher elevations where there's a lot more water. But this yucca, the fruit, it grows like a banana. It's some yucca is like a oblong and like round, but people back in the ancient days, um, they survived off of this plant. Like you can, um, you can eat the, the fruit, you can eat the blossoms, you can harvest the, the root as soap. You can use the, uh, the spiky parts of the plant, the, the yucca, the, the thorns, I guess you could say. You could make them into textiles. The ancient tribes before Navajo, because Navajo is, a, um, is like a, a new amalgamation. We're like a creolization of the ancient tribes. So there was tribes here in Arizona that no longer exist today, but they exist through us. We have their blood. And so that would be like the Anasazi, the Mimbres, the Sanawa. Um, and there was a bunch of them, all the Hohokam further south. Some of them had like Uto Aztecan languages. And then there was this Athabascan influence because Athabascan tribes come from the north, from like Alaska. And there was this mixing that happened before European colonization. And so our clans talk about that history. And so that's why it's really important for us to, to say our clans, to acknowledge our, our own roots, but also those matrilineal lines since the beginning of time and our creation and everything is supposed to center us and humble us. And you'll see that this is like a, a common thing in Native American culture. A humility and showing um, gratitude towards your elders and um, and there's sort of these patterns that kind of evolve like um, they sort of are produced like four is like a, these repetitions of four and we'll we'll see that in my work in a bit um, but um, anyways I want to share my screen let's see and I want to give you an idea of how big my reservation is. Here's the Navajo Nation. And I'm right now, today I'm in Flagstaff. But this is traditionally, traditionally our territory as well. 
but this wasn't like finalized, like no other tribe was allowed to be here because we had all kinds of tribes here and still do. Like you, as you can see, the Hopi reservation, the Hopi tribe is in the middle of my reservation. They live right in the middle. And then we have another reservation too, not listed here, but it's the Paiutes. They have some land here. So there's two other tribes within the territory of my tribe. And we have always um, helped each other through the ages. Um, there were times where we did ha have skirmishes and battles, but we never like, you know, went all completely like crazy on each other and tried to kill each other, like decimate each other and commit genocide. But instead we, we have influenced each other. Like even with the Hopi tribe, we exchange ceremonies with them. And we still do those ceremonies to this day. And it's really amazing to see because the, the Hopis have a ceremony that the Navajo gave them where they dress as Navajo people, which is crazy. Um, anyways, I wanted to show you the little map of kind of where we're at, what the reservation's kind of looking like. Um, and I'll reference this map too, as I talk about water and things like that. Um, so let's begin in my early years, maybe 15 years ago. I was, I was so rebellious growing up. I, I didn't care about money. I was interested in radicalism. I didn't care about the system. I was so anti everything. I wanted to know my culture on an in-depth level. Um, but I couldn't find much avenues to find it. But my father was very traditional. He was very into warrior culture, but not just Navajo warrior culture. He was interested in all the tribes. He would research Nav or um, tr native tribal wars and know about all these warriors, you know, like, you know, Geronimo, Crazy Horse, Tecumseh. Um, and there was just so many more throughout history. Um, like Ganado Mucho, and you know, these, these names are coming back to me. And so he influenced me from a really young age, but I ended up going into like, just like um, this, this sort of political radicalism. I was interested in, in the stories of American Indian movement, of the Black Panthers, of, of Yellow Peril, all of these, these things that were happening in the 60s and the 70s and, and I was so interested in it um, to keep going. You know, like, here's a piece I made. I'm like, this is kind of something I do. If you look at my other work, I always ended up making like a lot of <laughs> cops being shot with arrows. And it's because I felt racially profiled like all the time. I was stopped by police. I just witnessed it in my community. Um, and I was always dealing with police more than my friends, it seemed like. And I was like trying to find ways to deal with these, this angst, with this anger um, coming from um, a reservation, coming from a border town, um, the racism that existed there. Um, and it just seemed like there was no way out of it. And so I tried to find ways out of it. And I ended up getting to know other native people who were interested in the same things. They were interested in the culture. They're interested in resistance. Um, and they were interested in like anti like materialism. They didn't want to go through like the path of you know career and you know, this predictability and have um, the nuclear nuclear family. Um, they were interested in something deeper. This this piece is called Tse, and Tse is referring to the the belly button or like when you're born. There's like a piece of the uh, umbilical cord that is. Um, attached to you. And so that umbilical cord, it's called tse. And what traditional Navajo people do is they plant it somewhere in the ground to anchor you for your life. Like this is, you are directly connected to the earth, specifically right here. And sometimes they'll put it next to like a, a baby tree. So you are connected to this tree here. <laughs> like it's a, you know, it's like metaphor, but it's beautiful. It's be my culture has all these connections that we do, these things that we do that are, and this isn't like a big ceremony either. It's just a part of the culture that, um, and it's interesting because American culture is so, um, it's so, um, how do you say, 
um, devoid of culture, you know? And then here's me continuing on. I'm like making pieces, like upside down American flags and stuff. But, you know, and, and then I started reading political um, pieces about like decolonization. And this piece is inspired by a Franz Fanon. And this um, quote, colonialism is not satisfied merely with holding a people in its grip and emptying the native's brain of all form and content by a kind of perverted logic. It turns the past of the oppressed people and distorts, disfigures, and destroys it. This work of devaluing pre-colonial history takes on a dialectical significance today. And so like I was reading these things, and I was, it was just fueling my anger, honestly. I was finding a way, trying to find a way to, to, to just vent these, these things. And I would research history, you know, like Lincoln who was the president in uh, 1861 to 65. And there was 53 different forced marches of indigenous people in 1864 and 1866. So two years, there's 53 different forced marches which is crazy, like this history was never taught to me or any of that. And as I started to learn more about, about history and my, even my tribal history, I realized like it was how it was formulated, how we were put into these prisoner of war camps. The reservation is a prisoner of war camp and how these tribal governments were started. They were started as um, companies. They were started as a, um, a way to officially give out land for resource extraction so that companies outside the reservation would exploit them and make a lot of money. Um, and we'll get into some of that later. I'll, I'll talk about some of my other projects. But then after you know, getting into all of these heavy political and historical issues, you know, I, I, there was a part of me that was wanting to deal with things in an abstract way. And for me, you know, I started working with like this Buffalo piece and for me, it was um, the Buffalo. There were 60 million, 60 million in this country. There was a great Northern herd and a great Southern herd, 30 million in each herd. And this like was the way that we native people lived off the land. So many tribes survived off of this, but because of colonization, they realized we have to destroy, we have to decimate the food source so that we can get the tribes and contain them and put them into the reservation so we can you know, take their land. And so th this, this happened on a crazy scale, this, the genocide of, of these other animals. Um, and there, the population was reduced down to 400 by like the, um, the late 1800s. But because of conservation work, they have been rising in numbers. I believe they're like at 50,000 from the last I'm aware of. Um, then, you know, I would learn about histories of indigenous resistance, like Kent Posh. He is a Modoc warrior from Oregon, and he is noted as being the, the only native warrior to kill a general, an American general during the Indian Wars. Um, his, his little combat group was so feared that they, they used to hide out in this area of volcanic rocks and there was a lot of fog there. So they were you know, using guerrilla warfare going in and out, but their numbers were so small. So they were forced to uh, sign a treaty, give up their arms, be peaceful. But during that process, that's when Kent Posh uh, shot General Canby. Um, and so like these became like my idols, but you know, later on in life, I would give them up though, because I realized that there was this um, aggressive negativity involved here that was influencing my own soul. Then I started creating like political pieces that were more about solidarity. I was recognizing that the issues I was facing in my history and whatnot, other people have faced in, in their own other histories too. And so I made this piece, which is really based off of a Martin Luther King quote, but I created, um, may solidarity fall on everyone like rain and racial justice flow like a raging river. Let's see. And so as I started to research more about my own tribe, 
there is these issues that are happening to this day around water because Arizona has been in a drought for like 20 years. It's crazy how long it's, it's been going, but I wanna show you the Colorado River. The Colorado River, major river, goes through Colorado, comes over here, is going down through Page over here, Grand Canyon, it flows through. And then it comes over here to Bullhead City, Lake Havasu, it goes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Big river, seven tribes get their water from this river. There's, it's divided in between an upper basin and a lower basin. So as I was figuring these things out, learning this history, the tribe, my tribe was fighting for access to water. We didn't have uh, infrastructure to, to give water to our own people, but instead the water, it was given to other places. Here, I'm working on the, a mural here and it's the Colorado River and this is, the, the bigger part, the bigger river right here is the, the big Colorado. And we have the little Colorado, this uh, light blue little one. But if I zoom in here, you can see what I'm talking about, like the where the river is going. Arizona, here's the river. And so there was this pipeline created, the Central Arizona Project, and it went into the Colorado River and it diverted water to Phoenix and Tucson. And there was a, a power plant called Navajo Generating Station. And this power plant would pump the water from up here in Page, it would pump the water from over here all the way down 300 something miles. And they would use this um, coal. It was a coal-fired power plant. They would get that from my reservation. And they were, they basically ripped off the Navajo people. We should be like totally rich off of, off of like the, the tons of coal that was extracted over the decades. But we we got it was something crazy, like um, you know, like dimes on the on the ton for for coal. And they used this pristine water from the Black Mesa. And this is like artesian water. It's like really, it exceeds um, water quality levels in other parts of the United States. And they used to use that water to pump a uh, coal slurry to this um, generating station, Navajo generating station. And then it was so ironic because we're giving all this, all these resources up and being exploited to produce cheap water and electricity for Phoenix and Tucson for these bigger cities. And it was, you know, to this day, it's unsustainable. And the lawsuits continue to this day. Um, on the Navajo Times, the newspaper, the current issue is about water, Arizona versus the Navajo Nation, because we're still trying to find a way to get a, the government to bring us infrastructure. Um, and the state of Arizona is panicking because they're like, we don't have enough water to last. We don't know what we're gonna do. So they had to put up a drought contingency plan. And this is the first time they've ever done it. Um, and it's just this big legal mess. So let's keep going. Other parts of the state of Arizona are having water issues too. I did this piece um, in San Carlos Apache Reservation. And over there, there's this place that is sacred to the Apache people. And it's called Oak Flat. And for them, it's where a deity came up out of the ground. Her name is Usen and taught Apache people how to be Apache. And so the Apaches, they would have a female puberty ceremony there um, in that location since the beginning of time. But because of colonization, they were pushed to a reservation. They weren't allowed access to go there. And it wasn't until the last, um, you know, four or five, six years, they started going back there and doing their ceremony. It became a national park. Oak, Oak Flat is a national park. But then this company called Rio Tinto comes along and they want to dig a coal mine down there. And it's like, they want to dig out a big old hole underneath the sacred site. 
and eventually it's going to cave in on itself and destroy it. And then all the towns in that area, all those little mining towns like Globe, Miami, they where are they going to get their water? If that happens, the mining um, company is going to use up all the water. Um, they don't know where they're going to get it. It's just this crazy thing that happens, you know, and if, when you start looking at things and we, we start seeing almost like the end, it feels like it, the, the apocalypse is coming. This is a related piece too I created for the Save Oak Flat movement. I have a little map at the bottom. This is Rio Tinto. This is the, the copper mine. Um, so I want to jump to this other point in my life where I faced, um, uh, you know, practice solidarity with a different tribe. This was Standing Rock. Um, and in Standing Rock, there was this um, pipeline that was going to be built. And it was built, the Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, $3.7 billion project. And they were going to take the oil from the Bakken fields of North Dakota to Illinois, but they had to cross a river. And so the town of Bismarck was right there. And they were like, we don't want this pipeline here. Put it south. And so if it breaks, the pipeline breaks, there's oil in our water, it won't affect us. It'll go downstream to the Standing Rock Reservation. It'll, it'll uh, start messing with the native people south of us. And so that was, that was um, being built, this pipeline. And I, when I went there, I started spending time there. I spent two months in Standing Rock and I created some banners in my time. And like, we stayed in these teepees and it was really cold and really hard to live there. But this would bring me a greater perspective because I had all of this anger and angst and whatnot in me, but I didn't have any peace. And this was something that I really was striving for. I would go to all of these ceremonies and, and try to find a way to, to, to bring myself into balance. In my, and I would um, create artwork in, a, in, in my own spiritual way by praying, uh, giving little offerings, whatever I had. Um, I felt like this was a way for me to, to give back to the community in a spiritual way. Um, and I, I tried so many ways to, to practice this sort of uh, spiritual artivism kind of thing I was making for myself, but I, I never found the profound healing, but I witnessed a lot of spiritual things happen. I've witnessed things that are uh, supernatural. Um, I've, I've seen... Um, um, and I like remember a, that. Oh, yeah, you remember uh, Standing Rock? Yep. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. <laughs> I'm glad to hear someone, you know, I'm like, oh, I get on these tangents. Um, so then I started looking more at my own culture and trying to find the beauty within that, because there's so much about activism that is about the world, about the economy, about things that are outside of you. And you, you put yourself into these positions that are hectic, that are like Standing Rock, there's a lot of movement there, uncertainty, chaos. Um, your people are risking their lives at certain points. Um, and so I tried to find something that's more meditative. How can I maintain myself? Because I was getting burnt out and I started looking at like old vintage photos from my tribe. I started researching more into my own culture. And through these, you know, I, I was, I was bringing in about beauty, meditating on my elders, meditating on the land. I call this one eyes like arrows. I call this one Yekais Daha, which is referring to the Milky Way. The top part right here is like appears in Navajo sand paintings. We have these sand painting ceremonies. Um, these, are, these were like made up more, more out of fun. Um, so this would lead me to this new era in my art practice where I, I was less political, I was less direct. I didn't want to be on the front line anymore. Now that I, I've had my fill of it um, and I was getting older and I wanted that peace. I wanted to feel what 
true holiness was, what it is. One moment. Whoa. <laughs> so I created this piece recently in, uh, in November, December of this past year, I went to Belgium and I participated in this art show and it's called the Jonigo Yikado. There's a number of artists there. And so I created something a little more poetic here. You know, I, I, I call this one Blessed Visions. And this wasn't about the politics really or being overt. It was more about poetry and beauty and connecting to the land and realizing, you know, we're made of the land. We are the land as well. We all come from stardust. We, we're connected in these profound ways that are spiritual. And I was trying to find that, what is spirituality? What are these things? And so I ended up going over to um, the Bay Area for my uh, grad school degree. And I remember I saw these symbols painted all over the place and they're called medicine wheels. Here's a medicine wheel here. And it's a pan-indigenous symbol and it's shared by multiple tribes. And my tribe has its own version of it. And I started putting out messages on social media, like where can I find these in the Bay Area? I'm like measuring them. And I just found hundreds of them. There's so many. And I found out there was a homeless Native American man who was painting these for like a decade. And as I started learning more, I started like decorating them with my own stencils. But basically what a medicine wheel is, it's four parts. It is four aspects. It refers to the four directions, of course, like east, south, west, north, but it also refers to the four aspects of ourselves, which is the spiritual aspect, emotional, physical, and intellect, our mind, um, our mental aspect. And so another way to perceive this is my uh, body, physical, the soul, and the spirit. The soul, the soul is, is the non-physical part of you. It is your, your mind and your emotions, your heart, your mind and your heart. And it's your free will. That is your soul. That is completely you. But the spirit the spiritual aspect of ourselves is a part of us, but it's not completely us. It's the part of us that is connected to everyone else and everything else in the universe. This is the part of us that is higher. And then you have the body, the flesh. We live in this physical reality. And so as I was learning these things, I was learning that the spiritual aspect was more powerful, had authority over my soul and over my body. But my spirit, I didn't know how to guide it. I was searching for a way to, to, to bring balance to myself. And in Navajo, we call this hojon. Hojon is um, spiritual beauty, spiritual balance. And it, in another way, you could say that the middle part here would be hojon. And so I created this tour. I mapped out all these medicine wheels in Oakland, California. That's Lake Mary at the bottom corner. And I invited people, native people to come out with me and come and decorate them and paint, paint them during the first Friday art walk. And here we are, we're, we're decorating them. We use clay to decorate them because it's an art walk and they don't want to get arrested. Um, here we are, we're giving offerings, we're, we're sharing tobacco in a ceremonial way. Some of my friends were uh, singing songs, cultural songs, like kind of like the song I was sharing at the beginning. Songs for fun, songs out of joy, songs to celebrate each other, celebrate uh, the gift that is the earth, to celebrate the uh, masculine and feminine energies and all the energies.
And then, you know, they would dry up and they would kind of be faded away after some rain, leave like a ghost. And so this really changed my direction as far as my art practice goes, especially after Standing Rock. There was so many people, I can think of four people who died that I served with in Standing Rock, um, native and non-native, who have committed suicide or died because of some other things, some like alcoholism, or they were put in a sketchy situation, they were stabbed, but something happened to them. These terrible things happened to them. And, and I was thinking, if only if I had something to share with them, to, and that's what the Madison Will Project became for me. It became something that I could share with anybody. I didn't care if you were native or not. Like this is something that is talking about something human, and we're all human. We all have these aspects, and if we can figure these things out, we can. If we can start visualizing the these four aspects within ourselves, like this is a Navajo style. And we have the responsibility to cultivate all of these parts of ourselves. And if we don't, then we like are repelling each other and, or we're um, attracting certain things in other people. Codependency kind of happens when, the, when we have these, these breakdowns in our medicine wheel because our medicine wheels interact with each other. But they also, if you're like in an intimate relationship, they overlap. Your medicine wheels overlap with your partner. And then you have all of those issues or, or um, things that are happening in there. You have this relationship going on with them. Um, and so other things that their medicine will represent is like the East for Navajo people is white. And it represents the, the dawn or like inspiration and new ideas. And it's in Navajo, it's in Sahakes referring to the mind. And then as the sun rises, it arcs to the south. And the south is blue. And that represents nahatat, which is like, um, you're putting these new ideas into a plan for your day. And then we go to the west, the sun arcs, and it goes, sets in the west, and it's yellow for us. And that represents ina, which means like life, or like putting those plans into action. And then the North represents Nahokons or Sihasin. And uh, Sihasin is like reflection and represents the nighttime. And Navajo, traditional Navajo people, they would pray four times a day during the morning, the midday, noon, sunset, and at night. Um, and so I was learning how to balance myself. I was learning how to do these things for my own self. Um, and I wasn't so strict to do it in like a, a Navajo centric way because I spent so much time in par partaking in other tribal ceremonies, but I also researched religions from all over the world. I was researching things from like my art history classes um, and I was compiling this, my own spiritual practice. And I was, I was learning how to, to really build myself up from the inside. Um, Instead of how I was before, I was so active and, and without doing the inner work, without cultivating that inner side, without um, having my roots grow and expand. And so I would be easily, when I was younger, I would be easily um, overburdened, easily overwhelmed by things. Um, and it took a long time to, to generate this practice. And, and so here we have a Navajo storm pattern. And, all storm patterns kind of have this layout. We have like these four arms. This is lightning here. Here's some more lightning. Here's a cloud. These things here are clouds. These are raindrops. And this represents the wind. And so in, in Navajo, we say, Shaman Hatsan do and what that means is my mother earth, because earth is seen as a, a, a female energy. Nahatsan, Hatsa means woman, but Nahatsan means mother earth. You can't say earth like, like as a neutral 
um, entity. It's always associated with the feminine in Navajo way. And then the sky is always associated with um, um, the masculine. And Father Sky is referring to creator. It's referring you know, to the heavens. Some people might interpret that as God. Um, and so what a storm pattern is representing, it's representing that, that energy between Mother Earth and Father Sky. When that lightning comes down, there's this energy, this, this um, just almighty energy spiritual energy um so i i that's why i really love storm patterns this is the first one i did in the medicine wheel project um here's an opening shot from opening night and there was other artists involved there um, other navajo people um and belgian artists as well um and then upstairs i did a, a like a triptych with medicine wheels These are all based off like Navajo geometric patterns. Um, and these geometric patterns come from different areas on my reservation. They were, um, cause we're like traditionally known for our rug making, our textiles and our silversmithing. Um, and so certain styles come from different areas like the Klagato style or the Ganado style. Then I would make pieces that are um, more circular, radial. Um, in Navajo, also, we kind of do things clockwise all the time. And this is like, how do we say, though the way of the world or the way of like Hujongo, the way to the beautiful way they do things. Um, the opposite way would be Hochon, which is chaos, <laughs> balance and then chaos. And so I call this piece um, Chelata Hojon and Chelata Hojon, like Hojon, Hojon has that word in there, Hojon. It, it means flower, Chelata Hojon. But it, in that word is Hojon. And it's talking about that spiritual beauty that's in the flower, the radial aspects of a flower, our connectedness to the universe in these radial ways, in these uh, circular and cyclical ways. Um, you know, the, the medicine wheel represents other things. It re represents uh, when we're a baby, when we go into adolescence, into adulthood, and then elderly, it represents the four seasons. Um, there's so many layers to the medicine wheel that help ground us and remind us of our, of our place, of our humility that we must have. Um, and so I always ask people, what is holiness? What is holiness to you? For me, holiness is all the good things. It's joy, it's peace, it's righteousness, it's gentleness, it's forgiveness. All those things are holy. I spend so much of my time in sacred sites and in certain ceremonies, and I realize that the inner, the inner part of me, my, my own medicine wheel, has a whole has potential for holiness, for potential for um, like wholesomeness, fullness, and that it was up to me to to. And I was searching, I was going other places to find it, but it was all really just all within my own self to to grow these things. Um, I feel like I've accomplished most of what I wanted to to share. Yeah, yeah, thank you, everybody, for hearing my rants and whatnot. And in the future, if you have any other curiosities or questions, feel free to send me a message or anything like that. And uh, have a blessed life, everyone. Have a wonderful life. Um, yeah, and uh, maybe maybe think about some of these things, the, the medicine wheel. And um, and if if um, even if you want to someone to guidance in in a in a little ritual, in a little forgiveness ritual or something like that. I can be here for that as well. But anyways, blessings, everyone.